This is this whole thing is done in Inkscape. No, no showed me how to do it. It's actually much easier than uh, than I ever thought it would be. It makes much better slides. Presentation. Yeah, it's an Inkscape with a plugin, and it, the displayer is actually Mozilla. Oh. Use that. It's cool three frames per second. Oh, you have Oh, you have Could you just have to like tell everybody five times and connect and share and pop everyone out? Oh, it's for uh, just talk about some of the basic stuff we're going to go over. Um, before, that, before I even get to that, I can see, show of hands, who has seen and knows what OpenShift is? That's the real part of it. Who's used it? Thank you. Yeah, who, who, uh, I guess, even Clint, whatever, those people. Like, who knows what platform is a service is and why it's different? <coughs> okay, so I don't have to spend a whole lot of time on platform as a service. However, if you're confused about platform or service, even after this talk, I highly suggest this wonderful book called <laughs> Understanding Pads, which comes out, uh, I think, on Jan uh, January 23rd. Not yet been, the title has not yet been released, although you can search for the title, Understanding Pads, because that's the title. It It'll be on Kindle yet, and, and all that, but uh, it talks about how Pads changes things for developers, sysadmins, architects, managers, because a lot of people still don't get it, especially outside of our, our world. So. What's the animal? Yeah. What's that? What is the animal? Uh, that is a tree shrew. Um, I don't know why it's a tree shrew, but I can tell you, I, pr I promise you, uh, that wasn't me. <laughs> that was me. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I'll just do the, the talk just to, to kind of give you an idea of how, how we should be structured. Um, and how, uh, basically how it works. And that's going to be important because the second half of it is going to be a talk that we ha I have never given, nobody's seen it. It's basically going to show you how to hack it and do things that we don't want you to do with it, which I thought sounded like a pretty cool talk. So uh, to, to get a, a quick overview of the difference between infrastructure and platform as a service, so the last two talks that were in this room, and I've been in here with Roddy for a while, so thanks for sweating it out. Um, the last two talks were sticking very much at the infrastructure as a service layer with uh, CloudStack and OpenStack. Um, and infrastructure as a service is kind of like I don't want to. I definitely don't want to make it sound like less than it is, but it's, it's it's a lot like the next generation of virtualization. It's the next step in virtualization um, that takes you know your your standard VMs and stuff into a fully managed solution that that is at the infrastructure layer. But what you're getting from infrastructure is at the end of the day you're getting a host, right? You, you're logging in, you choose whether that's a good. Uh, well, four or five or Fedora on there because those are the only three operating systems available in the cloud today. And uh, you and then you go and you manage them, you change them a lot like you would a, a physical host. Uh, platform as a service takes a couple steps up from that uh, to where you're just deploying code or just deploying your your app and it's run. Everything else is managed by by us and our team. Uh, I know we have some open shifters in here. This is Podios. Uh, Russell is around somewhere. He, he's not in here right now, but that's fine. Uh, J5 is, is joining the team soon, so uh, yeah. feel free to stop and ask some questions. Ask J5 too, because he hasn't actually started yet, so send him all the Yeah, yeah, ask me everything. Yeah, yeah. I'll, uh, we'll see how it <coughs> give you random answers. But yeah, so uh, yeah, so all the shift is uh, Red Hat's platform as a service, and uh, and you know, so a lot of ways you can kind of think of it as as kind of you know Red Hat as a service. So you know, we we're using Rel on the back end. We'll go into uh, some pretty in depth topics of how we're using Rel especially some of the new features that came across it. So if we look at kind of a traditional uh, computing model, this, this, I like this, this is the RHEL 6 model. Um, I spent many years on this side as a customer. So uh, you know, for, for me as a customer, Red Hat uh, took all this open source software from this whole large ecosystem of, of open source projects 
put it together in a concrete offering. They built it, they certified it, they distributed it. And then it was my job to find hosts for it, develop provisioning, configure it, do updates, uh, develop maintenance, make sure it was secure, do all the development. And then it was just kind of shared support, right? When stuff goes wrong, I have to deal with it. Or sometimes we'll make, a, you know, we'll pick up a phone call right ahead and we'll, we'll work on it together. But uh, the reason I like this slide is this is a lot of work. And there's a lot of people that uh, are in this room and RFICon and everything else that do all this every day. And there's a lot of developers in this room that don't want to think about this stuff. So uh, if we if we go to the next slide, you can see kind of the, uh, this is kind of the infrastructure as a service layer. We start getting into cloud computing. Uh, and I guess if, if we want to talk about specifics, you could look at EC2 in this case. So this isn't a cloud that you're running yourself, but uh, a different, uh, sort of in a different way. Now, the slide on the left, you see I took Red Hat out of there because at the moment, you know, Red Hat doesn't explicitly uh, do infrastructure and provisioning in the traditional sense, but you can kind of think of this as a partnership between uh, Amazon and, and Red Hat in that Amazon's providing infrastructure and provisioning and uh, Red Hat's still doing all the certification building and distribution of all of it. Uh, there's a shared, uh, a shared configuration and support layer where now you're logging into these pre-provisioned REL hosts uh, and you still have to make them do something. You know, REL is a platform, it doesn't do much on its own. And uh, same thing with support, when it goes wrong, you work with them to figure it out. But even with all that, it's still your job to do all the updates, make sure it's maintained, make sure it's secure, do development, all that stuff. So let's look at the platform as a service. Uh, so now uh, Red Hat is, uh, with OpenShift, is, is an official HAS provider. And you can see that uh, the requirements of the customer have gotten quite a bit smaller. Uh, Red Hat, uh, with, with uh, RHEL and, and with OpenShift and with our team, we now have, uh, uh, we take from the source, it's built, it's certified. Uh, the distribution part is all kind of, it's still there, it's just that uh, from the, the RHEL team, that stuff gets distributed to OpenShift. Uh, OpenShift team does the provisioning, the maintenance, updates, and the infrastructure. And then there's this shared layer where support and configuration gets, gets uh, put together. So uh, with, with support, when there's a problem, you need, you know, if there's a problem we don't already know about, we work together to fix it. Configuration is shared in that you're not getting a full rooted rel box. You have specific places where we're expecting you to put things. If your application right now stores everything in user lib docs, um, that's not going to work right away, and as you have to make some changes there. And security is the last one uh, in that the platform that you're utilizing is is maintained and secured by us. We have a, uh, an absolutely amazing uh, uh, security response team, Mark Cox. You, know, you see his blog post, he posts a lot of that. Uh, he works with us to make sure this is secure. We have other teams making sure this is secure. However, we can't automatically make sure that your uh, application is secure. If you go to the PHP uh, app and didn't do any user sanitation, you know, that's kind of on you. Uh, however, it's your... My uh, The cloud doesn't beat. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but on, on the other side, the customer side, all you have to do is, is develop, or, or upload your code, or upload your app, and it just works forever. Like, that's that's kind of the promise of PaaS, is that uh, all this other stuff you used to do is not a worry anymore because we're doing it. Uh, so, you know, that's uh, the promise it has, and, and we do it for, you know, uh, in terms of, of cost and stuff, like right now OpenShift is all free, um, there are other providers out there charging, but even that is, is relatively cheap compared to doing it all yourself, which is kind of how uh, uh, cloud computing is, that's really how cloud computing is going to win out. It's, the, you know, the technology and stuff, I really like it, um, but it's the, the cost of it that managers and, and uh, executives like. Uh, so. If we go and look at how would we how would we set up uh, OpenShift? Let's just say we didn't have any of the great new tools available. How would we set this up with with old school Unix, just Unix permissions and stuff like that? Well, it looked kind of like this, right? You, if, if 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 your if your host was this road, you kind of have a bunch of people just on it. Uh, uh, I guess you know a good example here would be Fedora people. Um, everybody just kind of logs in. They can kind of see around. Um, you know, there's not. You're, you're mostly protected from the underlying options. It's not like you're logging in and running YUM updates or things like that. But uh, if someone were to log in and be malicious, there's quite a bit that they could do, and certainly they can see what everybody else is doing. Um, you know, if Tom happens, if Tom Callaway happens to be on uh, uploading a package or compiling a package, I could certainly log in and see that. 
Um, in potential, I could I could uh, mess with it by creating a very large bloated uh, application of my own. But uh, you know, it's, it's kind of chaotic, but it worked for many years. So to, to fix this, uh, uh, in OpenShift, we've integrated a bunch of new features from RHEL 6, which are primarily in C groups. Um, hand namespace and limits. Limits have been around for much longer than that, but we're using them. And so now things look a little bit better, right? Uh, I like this picture. Yeah, it's a nice picture. But uh, I like the idea of these rooms where you kind of have this, this, this sort of container that you're in. Uh, you can see other rooms, but you, you know, you're not, you know, you're, you don't, you don't pass into the other rooms. You can see in them, you know, the security is still issue. But if I try to blow up beyond my room, uh, clearly the rooms will break, or, or at least tell me that that I can't uh, blow up beyond it. So, uh, if we combine those concepts with uh, the kernel namespaces and uh, SE Linux, now we're talking. And this is what OpenShift kind of provides. We have these. Uh, your individual applications are run inside of these SE Linux containers that are contained by, that are also uh, constrained by C groups and things. So you can't blow beyond what you're supposed to be bloating beyond. You can't see what other uh, applications on the system are doing, and uh, you certainly can't mess with them. And not only that, but you are further protected from the underlying operating system, which is the platform. That's where we live. So you know, we log in and do EM updates and things like that. Um, you can't log in and even see a lot of that stuff. So, uh, with, with OpenShift, you know that that's kind of our our bread and butter is taking these containers, uh, running them on RHEL because it is just it's RHEL. We we haven't forked the kernel or anything like that. We're straight RHEL uh, consumers, and we're using and pushing all these new new op, uh, these new technologies to their limits to produce what is uh, you know kind of Red Hat as a service. No, you saying you meaning LXC or not? Uh, not using LXC because LXC does not ship with Chrome. Um, but uh, LXC is just the username space for, or the, the user tools for kernel namespace. So even if we used LXC, the result would be very similar to what we have now with the, in, inside these kernel namespaces. Uh, and for, for those of you that haven't looked at kernel namespaces, they're, they're pretty cool. Um, we have them on Fedora People. You can log in and look at those at any time. Um, but the, the easy base example is a poly instantiated temporary directory. So I could log in and Toshio could log in and we would both have a slash temp, but we would see different things when we went to look in there. Obviously there's a lot of cool things that you can do with that um, when you're logging into the same host and seeing different things. Um, and a lot of ways, some of you are thinking, well, hey, isn't this just virtualization? Because uh, that's a lot of what virtualization does, right? It creates these little containers on a physical machine. Uh, it's different in a lot of ways. Uh, for, for example, right now we have thousands thousands of applications running in OpenShift, and we certainly are maintaining thousands of machines, quite a bit smaller. Than but the other part is with uh, memory. Uh, a lot of what is expensive in the cloud is, is your memory footprint, because it's kind of hard to, to share memory across virtual machines. Uh, with Platform as a Service, though, uh, you get a lot of that shared memory benefit. Uh, for example, the first PHP app that's spun up on a node is more expensive than the second, which is more expensive than the third. Uh, you know, as you as you add all these applications to a single node, uh, it gets less expensive to run them, uh, and because of that, most of the PaaS models are uh, around smaller computing chunks that are massively scaled out across hundreds of nodes, uh, instead of kind of a more traditional uh, model where you're scaling up. If an application is misbehaving, you add more RAM to it. So um, that's kind of the the big theme of cloud is scale out uh, instead of up. Okay, so that's that's it for the uh, for the slideshow. There's more there that we could go into, but I don't think we need to. I'm going to go straight to uh, straight to demos and show basically how this all works. Uh, so in OpenShift, basically all I've done at this point is I've gone to OpenShift.RedHat.com. I've admired the panda for a moment, and then I went and signed up. I provided my username and password. Uh, I had to verify that, and that's it. Everything else should work down here. And uh, the only other thing I did was register a namespace, uh, a domain. So uh, I registered McGrath, because I'm Mike McGrath. And um, so all of my applications will be something dash McGrath.rhcloud.com. These DNS entries get generated when I create them. And so uh, obviously, uh, for most cloud, most cloud computing uses are currently based around new developments, but a, a new uh, just development. Uh, in this case, I'm going to show you how to get Drupal up and running. Um, obviously, so, some boxed uh, products should just run automatically, and, and Drupal is one of them that we have going. 
Um, but I think a, a lot of our target is towards new development. So this is just a demo of, of how it works. Um, we're going to create the application here. Uh -uh. I guess I can get that going. It takes a little bit. You can see that uh, I'm calling the application Drupal. So my it should be available at drupal mcgrathcloudcom And it's a PHP 5.3 layer. So basically what it's doing is it's going out to our broker, uh, which is what you contact. A, it's, a, it's a sort of a restish API. It should be full rest pretty soon. And it's, it's saying, create this Drupal application, PHP 5.3. Mike McGrath owns it. And the broker goes out, looks at all of our nodes, and says, this one's available, create it there. And now at this point in the process, it's done. It's created the application, it's up and running, and uh, it's added a DNS entry, uh, which ha happens to be the longest portion of this creation process right now. Uh, it's creates, doing it worldwide. It, yeah, it says worldwide. Uh, I, uh, I can give you a history of why that says worldwide uh, sometimes, but uh, it, it sounds very fancy. So, uh, so it'll, it'll try a couple times. I think last time I tried this, it got to retry number four, and uh, then it'll be created. It'll do a quick uh, sanity check to make sure the application is up, and, and that's it. What I will get on my local machine is a Git repository that is just a templated hello world Git repo. And it, anytime, any changes I make to that Git repo, when I push them, they'll automatically be uh, uh, be sent. Uh, when, I, when I do the Git push, they'll automatically be deployed as part of the deployment process. So you can see I've got my, my Git repo here, or my, uh, my new uh, templated Drupal app. It says welcome to OpenShift, all that stuff. Uh, now what I want to do is I want to add my SQL. So, and we're working on really fancy web interfaces for this. I still like the, the command line tools. Uh, but some of this stuff is already working in the, in the the web interface. So this is just saying, so my app Drupal, I need, a, I need to add a MySQL instance. So it's going out to the broker, broker is finding the app and say, hey, add MySQL. Broker says, okay, done. So at this point in time, uh, for as long as that took, it was you know, five seconds, whatever, um, I've got my MySQL instance <coughs> up and running. Uh, you can see my admin and uh, my admin password, the root password there. And you can see the connection URL is, is, this, uh, is on the loopback address, so you can't access this directly right now. Anyway. Wait, these are running on the same host. Like you in inside the same container yeah. with the MySQL daemon. Yes. Table. So there and, and and that's a good question. So the, the dash E means embedded, and that means you know add this to make this a part of the application. Add it as a as a cohesive unit. So this is inside of the, the actual application. It's it's in that same room as as the actual application. What would uh, be obviously, the alternative? what's that? What would be the alternative? The alternative would be a MySQL instance here and a web app here that then con contacts that. Oh, okay. Uh, which so they all be part of the application called Drupal. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And it would it would contact it. So like if you used uh, Amazon RDS for example and spun up your own MySQL instance, you could put that information in. Uh, we're not. Sorry, did you say you could or could not? You could. You, that's the, yeah. You can do that. Um, we're not offering that for the, the free version right now, but you know we're still uh, we're still in a developer preview. Can you actually have multiple databases? Uh, yeah, you can set up, I mean, you can set up as many databases as you want. I could add, uh, but I can only have one, uh, if I want to do it, the, and we'll get into the hacking part in a little bit, uh, but as it stands, you can only have one MySQL server, but you could add more, multiple databases to it. If you wanted to add more MySQL servers, this is a bit trickier, we can do it. Um, you could add Mongo to this too, or Postgres, or uh, that one's coming out pretty soon. Okay, so back to the demo. Pretty cool. Uh, this is the Git repo that was created as part of creating the Drupal instance. And I'm just going to do these two commands. Basically, this is saying, take this GitHub uh, template and, and push it. So we're going to pull it down, we'll push it up, and you'll see the, uh, the deployment process. So the first one was just bare bones PHP, and now this is actually adding Drupal to it. Yeah. So if, if, I, if I look at this, if I had looked at this before, you'd just see uh, an, an and uh, index.php and the health check. But when I just did that poll, uh, this is this is just standard Drupal code. Pretty much all we've added to this is uh, the commands to create the database, to actually import the database. So you can see uh, in the code I've got several environment variables listed. So OpenShift app name, the database password. This is the, the so-called right way to do it. It makes your application more portable. Uh, you could add and remove databases you want. The passwords can change, stuff like that. So uh, if, you're, if, you know, if you're the only one working on it, you can manually put the password in the Git repo if you want to. But 
um, it's generally recommended to use the, the environment variables. But all this does is check to see that the uh, database is created. If it's not, it'll create it. And when I get push all this, uh, it'll upload the Drupal code that we just created. And then you'll see, it'll go by pretty quick, but you'll see it uh, run these hooks and uh, actually import the data. What's the term for like the thing that you're running? Like, is it like slice or like? Uh, we we don't have a term. We don't have a term right now. We're we're working on some. It's like, cloud, <laughs> man. It's, it's a cloud. But a lot of people have uh, a lot of people have different different, different things we call it. I, I think it will. I think that we have to run it by legal to find one. But like Heroku calls them. Uh, what does Heroku call them? Uh, I don't know. Something. Everybody's got a little different name for. Them. So this is like a generic so system, right? It's like any time you're pushing something out there, you can put one of these hooks in to make an action happen as a consequence of that get push, right? Yeah, you know? exactly. So in this case, that, that uh, the, the, the push process basically goes like this. You push, it stops your app, it runs the pre-build script, it runs the build script. Uh, the build script, we have automatic dependency resolution there, so if you have you know, your setup.py or your gem file in there, it'll download whatever dependencies you need. Uh, and, and get them set up in your environment. It'll run the post build. No, the, it'll at that point build is then it'll run a pre. It'll run a deploy hook, which is the last step. I think at the deploy stage, your databases and dependencies are up, but the actual application is not up yet. Then it will deploy, start the application, and uh, run the post deploy script. So at any point in the in basically at any point in the, in the stages, you can overwrite settings. You can tell it not. You know, you could right. kill it, bring something back up. All those things. So uh, you can see here that it ran pre-build, it ran build, which uh, <coughs> some settings because Git doesn't honor uh, modes. So you know, we had that in our script. Uh, then it ran the deploy script, which uh, said the database was not found. It imported it, and then you, know, you can see I've got a new admin uh, password there. And this is not publicly available. If you have your laptop open, you should be able to pull this up, log in. Cool. I like the Drupal example because it's, it's pretty obvious. I mean, a lot of people use Drupal, so. Uh, and at this point, it'll just run like this forever. Um, all I have to do is, the only thing, as a developer, I have to make sure that if a new Drupal uh, version comes out, I need to do another git pull and a git push to update the code. OK, so let's say we want to mess with this. Uh, the first thing people. A lot of the, one of the first things people ask for is, is an actual shell account. Uh, we didn't offer that for a while, we do now. So if you log in, uh, this is it. Uh, you have a, a bash shell, um, there's little helper scripts to control all the apps, start and stop them. I can see uh, uh, my MySQL daemon's running, HTTP's running. What is this? Is that a dependency that I started? Uh, yeah, the uh, PHP, well, PHP, we, when we first did an RC create app, PHP is uh, bundled with uh, HTTP and Apache. So, in order for PHP to start, Apache had to start. And uh, so, it's just when we created that PHP app, it knows Apache needs to be on this. So, right at that point, you already had a web server running with PHP capabilities. Yeah. And then you just added Drupal to it. Uh, yeah, I just added Drupal to it, yeah. So, the, and, and that's literally a, uh, the, so if we look at where the repo is deployed, the repo there. This is that. Uh, this is exactly what was in my Git repo, but this is an archive of the Git repo. We can look at these are all the, the PHP files. This directory right here is in Apache. That's my uh, document root. So there, there's no magic there. This should look very familiar to everyone. So you had a question? Is there a way to use Git branches so that I can actually store code in there that's not? Pushing it live to the application. Yeah, uh, it'll only push live what's in master, and I think we're working on a. Uh, people have asked for Git submodule support. I suspect we'll have that one soon too. So, uh, so basically, you know, looking at this, this is all fine. Um, we can uh, we can kill our HTTP processes and look and see that it is in fact down. <laughs> it's not very uh, fancy looking, but. Uh, okay. That's how that works. So uh, before I get into some of the, the bad stuff, I did want to show one other thing, and that is uh, continuous integration. So just a quick show of hands. Who knows what continuous integration is and how it makes your life better? All right. 
At least that's good. I go to cloud computing conferences sometimes and they have no idea what it is. <coughs> Although, e even though some of them have used CloudBees, which is kind of CloudBees is bread and butter. All right, so uh, let's just look at the command line tools for this. So right now, uh, if we wanted to create an application that auto runs the tests to do the deployment and doesn't result in any downtime except for the actual deployment process, this is basically how you do it. You set up, uh, you, you do it with an enable Jenkins, and uh, basically what, what I'll, just, I'll just run it and explain it when it's going. So we'll do an RHC create app. So this is how you do a Python app. It's using the WSGI interface. So this is going to go out and do two things. Uh, my, my account can have up to five applications running. So it's going to go out and it, it's noticed that I don't currently have Jenkins running. It's going to create a new Jenkins app for me, which will be available at jenkins-mcgrath.archcloud.com. Next, it'll create my whale app, which is, you know, we created Drupal earlier. This one's just called whale. And uh, if you remember back to Drupal, we embedded uh, MySQL into Drupal. This one will embed the Jenkins client into whale. And what will happen there is when we push, uh, instead of stopping the application, it will leave it running. Uh, Jenkins will be told that there's a new build available. It will go out, spin up a new uh, build instance, which is also part of your application count. It'll then uh, pull the repo down, do the build, run all the tests. If any of them fail, it'll stop the, the push process. Now, your, your commit has still been pushed. This all happens in a git post hook, but the deployment will have failed because your tests failed. Uh, so uh, a couple notes about that. One, your application stayed up that whole time, which is nice. But two, the builder, uh, the builder apps have more memory, uh, which is especially important for the JBoss guys that are doing JBoss builds. Uh, they tend to be very memory heavy. If it had succeeded, it would have taken the results from that build and put them back into our original app that was that we'll be running at whale-mcgrath.archcloud.com. And uh, that deployment process is pretty quick. It's an R sync, and then there's a restart. So, uh, especially when you get into more uh, uh, more sophisticated uh, applications and builds, the testing takes quite a long time. So you don't want your app to be down during that time. This will go to, to account number four again. Can I create an app of various types? Previously we had PHP, now we have WSGI. What if my application requires both Perl and PHP and some other weird? Um, we can, uh, so by default you have to combine them somehow. So they, you can have them both running at the same time, but they'd be at different websites. So what you need to do is combine them with a proxy layer, which things like that are things that we're, we're working on so you can combine different applications to a website. Because not too many people run web apps out of site. Um, you know, if you go to fedoraproject.org, there's a wiki there, there's the main site. So those, those sort of proxy apps is, are, are kind of what you're talking about that would combine all this into a coherent namespace. Okay, so we log into Jenkins. Look at whale, which should look just like the PHP app back before we templated it. Uh, this is Jenkins for people who haven't seen it before. You can see it automatically created a whale build for us. Um, more oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I'm logged in. I can see my whale build. It hasn't actually run yet. Okay, so this get push will look a little bit different. It notices that I have Jenkins enabled, and so it's telling me uh, that it's going to create a uh, it's going to create a new Jenkins build uh, under uh, whale build. And so right now it's sitting. You can see that uh, the build queue is going. And the reason this is taking a moment is because it's actually creating a new application for this to build it. For our RHC user info, I should see all the applications running. Drupal was the first one that I created. Uh, you can see that uh, Jenkins uh, is the actual Jenkins app that we saw. Whale is the other one. And so what it's doing right now is, is behind the scenes is creating a third app, which I think will be called Whale Build. And, uh, 
as soon as that uh, as soon as that build is up, it'll behave just like a Jenkins slave. Uh, it'll do the build there. It'll send the results back to Jenkins, which will then send the results back to the, the main. Uh, yeah. So we've got our whale builder app, and uh, now Jenkins is doing his handshake to say hello, Jenkins slave. And soon uh, it'll go by quick because there wasn't much in the uh, in the actual. Uh, we we only made a white space change, so it's not like it's going to rebuild. But you can see it uh, went to building whale build, and uh, if we refresh, it's probably done by now. Must have done. Maybe you broke it. What's that? I said maybe you broke it. One can only hope. <laughs> <laughs> But well, it's a good thing, but I can show you, you know, it's, it's got a uh, console output, you can watch it do its thing. Um, it's, oh, and it, it doesn't rebuild everything every time, it actually syncs your old dependencies down and syncs it back up. So if you have a lot of dependencies, it's not like it has to download them a lot. Okay, so you can see this was a successful build, our console should agree, uh, waiting for job to complete success, and the, the new app build has been deployed. Uh, and obviously the thing size is Jenkins, this is just stock Jenkins, so you can see the build was a success. You can go and get the elements out of it. It's everything you know you would you would typically see in, in Jenkins. So before I go on from there, does anybody have any questions about where we where we are right now, how things are going, this and that? All right. Uh, so let's just say that you uh, you're the type of person that doesn't want to run uh, one of these apps or doesn't want to run. Uh, Let's say, you know, let's say that uh, you want to run your own version of Python or something else. We're, we're working on ways to make this easy, but uh, you wouldn't come to this talk if it was easy. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the, the chalkboard out real quick. And we're going to get into some of the architecture of how this actually looks. So with uh, Whale, well, let me grab that archcloud.com. Uh, that actually is a DNS entry that points to a system that has Apache on it. This uh, Apache system has a whole list of, uh, of all the applications that are running on that host. And they're just uh, virtual, uh, they're just uh, standard uh, virtual name host hosting. So Apache goes to the books that are a virtual host. And then that gets directed to one of our loopback addresses that 127 that's something. Mike, yeah. um, sorry, one stupid question. Yeah. Those V hosts in Apache, are they in the um, the V host file or are they added as includes in the bottom of the comp file? They're added as includes. Yeah. So we, we create everybody gets their own dedicated file for that. Cool. Uh, you don't get to edit those directory at this layer. So, uh, but it's directing to some loopback address on port uh, port eighty eighty. So this is this is kind of standard. Like we can, we can understand how, how this works. Um, when we do a push, this goes down. That's how we got that five hundred three earlier, because proxy the reverse proxy host could not get to to this address. So um, I showed earlier how you can actually log in and look at uh, look at these hosts. And one thing I didn't mention uh, that I probably should have is a cartridge type. Uh, cartridges are, are just, you know, PHP was a cartridge. It's just what we call a way to access some feature. Uh, it was this raw 0.1 type. We're working to extend this. Uh, right now, raw uh, doesn't have a direct web interface, but it's good for process jobs and stuff. But the point of it is that it doesn't do anything on its own. You can log in, you can upload uh, your own files, whatever you need to. Just remember that if you're uploading a uh, Anything that relies, uh, you know, anything that is, uh, you know, seeking power, something that relies on local uh, native libraries to be there, uh, build them on Rel 6 so that they'll, they'll run here. You can't build, you, know, you couldn't build your own version of Bash uh, in Fedora and upload it here and expect it to work right away. Although that might work. Uh, but you, you, get, you get the idea. So we know that uh, our application is listing on, listing on one of these on this port. And so we can actually log in and look. We have access to all of this. Uh, I can go look at the whale. This is where the actual directory is created. And you can.
so this looks like a standard Apache config. You can see that uh, we're listening on uh, 127.35.1. Uh, you've got uh, you know, the user group, all this stuff. This is a very small small bit of information. And you can see that I'm also uh, bandwidth controlled here. And we have bandwidth controls at several different layers. Uh, that's a common thing that we have at OpenShift. Uh, is several layers, especially around security and stuff. If someone finds a way around our SE Linux constraints, we don't just want to rely on SE Linux. Uh, so we have several layers of, of security in place for most things that you would want to mess with. But we've got this Libra.conf, and I can see it's uh, listening on this port. It's uh, got a you know a uh, true and or it's pointing to my uh, directories for logs, and it should have the document root and it's document is pointing to uh, where you think it would. But let's say that we don't want to uh, we don't want to run things with, with this bigger.com. Uh, so we can copy that. And we can see this is uh, the actual start command that was used. So let's just say we want to get rid of the the uh, or we want to change it in some way. I think of some good way to do this, but uh, I'll just get rid of my man with just a group. So this is my new uh, my new config file. Uh, now the, the thing that's interesting about this is I'm still constrained by security, so I, I haven't really made it a change that dramatic. But let's say you didn't want to use the default Apache uh, directory, or let's say you wanted to load a different module or have your own custom Apache module. Um, you can do that there. So now we just need to change the way this uh, is started. I can stop. I should stop. We'll point this to our new leader. output drops quotes. Yeah. There we go. Okay, so you can see that my uh, Apache config is now started with this other Apache custom, a custom config that I've got. Refresh and see that. Uh, let's look at the log. Yeah. Did I delete more than yeah. you? You're just telling me this now. Yeah, I thought it would be funny to see what happened. <laughs> yeah, that would be funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, actually, I saw you doing it, then I thought I shouldn't pipe up because Mike is way smarter than me. Actually. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm up here talking. I have no idea what I'm doing. Okay, we happy with this? Mm -hmm. That might, it might not have been it because I was pretty much saying to last time. It see. just looked like the original. Yeah, same, okay. same area. Good. Well, that was kind of the fun. This is the same one we did one of them. It's still after. Yeah. I mean, it'll, it'll stop me. No way for, uh, I forget the icon, but Wikipedia always has it. That's where I go. If you really want to see any really forward file on introduction to open shit, I kind of do. <laughs> I'm happy to do it. We have definitely considered this place. Well, you're not running its roots, so you know. And actually, well, no, I won't. You need to work this right here. Yeah. 
close, but they do that whole point. Well, they have they can do limits here if you're not, but yeah. I have to let them all die so I can walk back in. Uh, and also, if, if you happen to do that, uh, let, let, me, let me show that again, just, just, just so you, if you're getting really adventurous and you can please screw yourself. So in theory right now, uh, I couldn't even log in to stop this thing because I can't spawn a stop process, right? So I'm screwed, right? It's, that's kind of the, the thing. So we, we've, we've considered this. <laughs> Just force stop. Is that the shut down everything command? It should kill my process too. Yeah, so that killed everything. And uh, so now I can, I've, I've reset, I can go back in and start screwing around again, and I can uh, start it again. So I probably wasn't paying attention earlier, but is each app a separate shell account? Yes, every app gets, uh, yeah, and even when you get into clustering and stuff that, we, uh, that hasn't been released, uh, even those individual apps have their own shell account. So that's why, that's why it's a UUID. Okay. Well, I'm not. I'm not done. I'm, I, I want this. Uh, I want this thing working. So let's find out. Uh, You're not winding up running the HTTPD as a different user, so how are you? No, I don't. I, mean, I don't think so. I'm, I am this user. So I, should be. I mean, I can always. I can stop it from here and start it. From here. Is part of the environment missing? Well, it seems like it. So let's find out. So there's something you should have there that you need to include that you're skipping. Yeah, what's in your control script? Starting with that. The control script, uh, so yeah, I'm actually that there's a, there's a whole tree of control scripts you got to worry about. So this is the actual script that is called. You'll notice that you can't change that directly. Um, I guess you can, but I guess we can change it. <laughs> so let's, let's look at the, the control script. And feel, feel free to poke around at these things. Oh, like okay. if, uh, if you're not supposed to be there, you'll know it. You'll get things like this. <laughs> so, stuff you can read, we, we allow you to read. Right. So this is the start. Yeah, I mean, this is what we're starting with, right? So this, let's just try this. Try just our, our custom. Uh, 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 I bet that's the problem. Uh, it's always SE lit. Let's try it instead of the temper, let's try a different pair. Let's see if that's the problem. Would you get SE Linux denials in your logs if you were being SE Linux denied? We have a lot. Well, it depends on what you're doing. Or we have a lot of no. We have a lot of stuff that we know you'll be doing that we don't care about. So we just know one guy. So. Not setting up your original one? Doesn't seem to be. But it should be since uh, basically when it's. Yeah. We need to have a big countdown timer to the end of the session. 
Five minutes. Yeah. Five minutes. Yeah. 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 You can ask me a question. The, the point oh, is, I, yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't run through this intentionally just because I, you know, the point is to show how it all works. So, so I, have I did think this was the case I'd love to ask about. Um, yeah, would, you can ask away. Don't, don't uh, let my. So one of the things I would really love to do is be able to have a replication in MongoDB so that I can have all rights going to one app and all of these coming to the other. Is that something that you're currently doing? There we go. Um, we can't do that currently. We're working on. Uh, so one of the things you know, so we have an option for right now is a difference between Express and uh, uh, and Flex. And this is all Express. If you go and see that under Express, there's currently a major uh, rework going on to combine those two into a, an individual product. Flex was originally designed for developers. Flex is more designed for uh, larger operational things. Uh, and instead of keeping those two independent as two independent products, we're going to merge them into a, a single product at some point. Which is kind of always always been planned for a, a consolidated view of OpenShift. Um, when we get to that point, you'll be able to uh, do your scaling. But keep in mind that the point of PaaS is that you're not going through and saying I need more of this or that. Like in theory, you say I want Mongo, and we do the scaling for you. So we'll be monitoring your Mongo applications, and they should just scale. You sure. won't have to mm -hmm. connect them together. The scale is not actually the primary concern. Uh, replication? No, it's actually that we're going to be running untrusted queries uh, in the uh, individual database. This should be a good use case for that because um, you'd have a bunch of individual Mongo instances, and if one of them died, like we'd be able to detect it, or if one of them got overloaded for some reason from a query. Right. The point is, we still want to collect data to the right instance, even if somebody completely bombs mm -hmm. the other one for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, we don't care so much if that one goes down. We'll fix it over time. We just don't want to lose rights. Yes, I can pull it up. J just to prove that I got this working, though, you can see I'm not pointing to. <laughs> you can see I'm not pointing to my custom data there, and that it is in fact working. So. <laughs> Three minutes to go. We'll do it live. <laughs> can I run cron jobs or supervisor? Uh, you can uh, cron jobs or supervisor. Super, super, so. Uh, if you uh, uploaded your own cron banging, you could definitely do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying you can't. You're still in your jail. That's that's on topic for this discussion. Um, but we're working on uh, a lot of uh, a lot of we're lo we're working to, we're reviewing a few different job scheduling uh, tools, mm -hmm. which I didn't realize this until I started looking. But there's um, just within the last like three years, there's been a whole suite of scheduling tools that have been released. Some of them are more suited to cloud than others. So I would suspect that uh, you know, since I'm still deeply involved with this, that we'll have some sort of cron-based solution because I know what the hell cron is. Uh, I haven't heard of a lot of those other ones until recently. So we've been going through looking at them because um, jobs, scheduling jobs is an interesting topic because you may want them to run as part of your app. You may want the applications to run or and have cron run on its own, maybe or have scheduled jobs run on their own to do something like the new manager. Cron exactly. But then, even when you're done with your manager, you need to you still need to notify mm -hmm. you're running apps. So there's uh, we have to figure a way to you know, properly integrate those and, and all that stuff. Uh, can I do like W gets from inside of here and uh, yeah. external network connectivity? Yes, we yes you can. Um, we uh, we block outbound ports with SE links for some stuff, but uh, uh, some mail ports are open and heavily throttled. Uh, some the, the web ports are certainly allowed. We are working on additional monitoring. Obviously, that's a, a concern from the security point of view. So mm -hmm. we're working on ways mm -hmm. to track that for attacks, like heuristically and things. Uh, let's get the uh, dashboard up. Hi, Panda. If I needed custom SE Linux policies, is that an add-on service that Red Hat offers, or is that you, a your SOL until? Uh, right now, it, it would depend on what it is, right? I mean, if you're if you want to like write to the RPM database, we're going to say no to that. Um, but if you want outbound to a port, like that's something we do quite weekly. We've been working with like uh, obviously people that use this and come in and participate on the forums. Like they're the ones we're listening to. So if, you, uh -huh. if there was a port you needed access to or something that wasn't right, the forums are a really place to go. And we our product managers actually do log in and and track that stuff. And that's where the majority of our smaller fixes. That's where sure. they come. So uh, we're about done, but let me let me go to the control panel and show you the, the current state of the control panel. The uh, developer tools are a little bit uh, farther from that. So oh, this is uh, I have two accounts. Um, 
this is my Emigrant account, but you can see I've got my, my single app running. <laughs> oh, this, wow, that's an old app. My God, that's like. That's from, I don't know if you've seen that. We've won. won. This, oh, this very well yeah. could be the app I created. The that the yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so they used to get out. Let's clone this bad boy. What is that checksum? Is that like a your user? Yeah, it's, the, it's a UUID. It's on it's on, on site. I'll definitely give you that. But uh, that's what we that's what we stuck with. Oh, cool. Wow. April of 2011. <laughs> we well, we launched in May, so uh, that's quite a thing. All right. So never that. Uh, I, I will talk about this forever if you if you <coughs> me, but seriously go try it. Uh, I have a lot of use cases that uh, uh, I, I really think that this will work for. And, and like just to be clear, like all this you know cloud stuff, whatever, blah blah blah. Like most of us that are doing cloud, we like we're here to change the way you all do computing. Like it's this is a vastly better model. Um, and the more I hear people talk and complain about some of the problems they have, like the the third infrastructure. Uh, it was kind of a boff that we had yesterday, but it was really about staging. Like a lot of the problems that 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 you would have in there, and, and any like most of my previous jobs, like a lot of that goes away. Um, especially for developers, you don't have to worry about a lot of stuff. For sysadmins, like so much in the last ten years, what a sysadmin, what the sysadmin job has become, is really more of a system technician. Like you're running around doing all kinds of silly BS, and it's it's really server technician stuff. Uh, when you start getting into cloud computing, you really get to focus on uh, that, that polish and keeping systems uh, interoperable. Um, and uh, for, in the OpenShift operations team, like we focus very heavily on self uh, uh, self healing. Like you know, we we get paid from time to time, but rarely do we get paid for anything that we have to do. And you know, it's 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 a really it, the, the tools that are built from the infrastructure as a service layer. And from the platform as a service layer, let you focus on getting your job done. So there's, there's just like if you look at it in terms of that, uh, it can really change the way that you're working and make you far more efficient. So, uh, and just, just as a reminder, if you do have any, if you do have any questions, I highly recommend <laughs> understanding that. All right. Anybody, any other questions? I have to answer that number. We're going late, and it's hot, so come on. <laughs> All right, get out of here.